Hi, Stuart. Really how cool is, nice to see you. How wonderful is this? Um, yeah, because the last, I just time, wanted to, the last time was sorry. the 25th um, free theatre anniversary. Is that right? It was, yeah, it was yeah. Down, in, down in Christchurch. And um, just, just, yeah, I just want to acknowledge Marion and the crew for doing this kind of thing. I just think this is just awesome, the way they are continuously weaving in the past and the present and the future and including us and weaving us back in and give us, us a chance to see what they're doing and just to see this, the thread that's going through, huh? that, that's really cool. Yeah, I think you absolutely and I um, second that and the Free Theatre is great at um, keeping its history alive and as you say, yeah. weaving back into its present, which is um, remarkable, uh, not least because it's had such um, a long history to to call on and to, to kind of reuse, so beautiful. And and was wonderful also to see that footage, Stuart, because I I haven't seen that since you know, the after party or something, you know, that footage of 1984. And I, I shared it with Leslie as well. And we were just like amazed, amazed at our young bodies <laughs> and, and, and the power of video to show gesture and tone. And I was so used to seeing only photographs. Huh? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, it was a real blast from the past. The last time I'd seen that was when Shirley Horrocks was putting together some stuff for the um, Free Theatre documentary, and I yeah. found the VHS um, in our storeroom, and so it was great to kind of glimpse it again then. But um, it was almost, I, I haven't watched the whole thing because it's, it's almost kind of too overpowering. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And, um, but, but what it made me realise, talking about technology, is it, 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 it was a wonderful um, archival piece of footage from the point of view of what was being used to describe what we were describing, right? So the big television sets, which were also used in, in Three Minds, up on the up on the wall, the overhead projectors, um, a, a kind of a vintage piece now, and yet everything that was being projected with them from the novel has basically just refined and repeated, hasn't it, along the way? I mean, the things that were happening in that in that production with the genius set of Graham Bennett, the way that he, you know, managed to get that modern technology thing happening and also that grungy corner of the proles. It reminds me now of the difference between the tech world and the analog world. Like those two realities. Yeah, exactly. Um, and I remember, and you might, I think you've got a much um, more vivid memory than I have of the, of the show, but we went round to see a guy who was doing computer animation, mm -hmm. um, you know, obviously very early on, and he was really um, doing some interesting work. And so he made, was, were this kind of swirling digital backgrounds as part of that video um, brought, um, projection that we had as part of that show. Anyway, I remember yeah. this place in St Albans and um, being so impressed that here we were with a show about 1984 kind of talking about the future and being literally cutting edge computer digital work at the same time. So, you know, hats off to Peter and to the various technicians that were involved in putting that show together because it was extremely complex. I mean, you look back at it um, now and those are all kind of technical forms that are very much, um, you know, they feel antiquated now, but um, but at the time that was kind of cutting edge technology in 1984. And who was to know? Like we, we knew and we felt, which is why we said the future is now, we felt that this was kind of happening, right? And the whole idea of the television and being able to be seen and to be and to see and the information that was going two ways, that was very big in the play. And that now we have that, literally have that in our telephones, right? So the moment when, for example, when Julia and Winston are sprung 
it reminds me when 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 they say you are the dead and it comes out over the over the television that you've been sprung and we know what you're doing it mm. reminds me exactly of when i get an ad about something that i've just talked to someone about 10 minutes ago and i'm yeah. like why am i getting this ad and i I have the same look on my face sometimes when I'm looking at the footage as I had then. It was like, why is this happening? Yeah, who's who, um, who is uh, eavesdropping on my thoughts in such a in such a um, unsettling way? But you know, uh, you know, I think part of the premise of 1984, the future is now, is that that technology was really disconcerting, and that was part of the dystopian way in which the theatre production. Um, uh, the aesthetic that the, the theatre production realised. But what is interesting now is how, uh, I mean, there is an unsettling nature to the technology, obviously, um, but also it is it really gratifies what our um, desires are as well. You know, we like having all that communication at our fingertips. We like being able to um, connect with people all around the world as easily as we can. We like the um, shop window that it provides for us. And I know that there is a, uh, when you think about it more closely or you burrow into the technology, it's very disturbing, but the face of it is very welcoming and very kind of gentle yeah. and Beautiful. disturbing. So, so, you know, that, that's perhaps um, something that has emerged from the real future that, wasn't quite there in the production and and you know how could it be but but the but the um big brother has a has a velvet glove for sure yeah well put the big brother has a velvet glove and um as they talked about in that social dilemma documentary it's like everybody was worried about artificial intelligence but there is actually a stage before that which has got nothing to which is scarier in a way than the artificial intelligence, which is our own, our own um, adoption of, of the whole model, you know, without questioning, right? And yeah. so that we're not, we might question, but we don't question too deeply because there are all these positive things that we're getting out of it. But then when you look at what's missing, like when I think of technology and I think of Zoom and how wonderful it's been to be able to have these kind of conversations over lockdown and all that kind of thing. Um, but there's, it's like, what's missing? And I think one of the best things that came out of 1984 as a performance, when we're talking about live performance, is that it very clearly had a felt sense of what is different. So the, from, the characters were very automated. If you look back, they were very characterized. They were char caricatures, right? They were like, the like automatons or figures to be manipulated. They were already automatons, yeah. And um, they were already, if you like, aware of how they should present themselves. And so in that way, I think it's really similar to like with Instagram, Facebook, we we don't do it in the same way, like you said. We do, it's different. It's changed. It's more subtle. But we present ourselves continuously how we feel we should be presenting ourselves, right? And the, the things that are missing are those awkwardnesses. The awkward, you don't see awkward moments on Instagram. You don't see awkward moments on Facebook. You see the presentation of what is society is saying is the stuff to be excited about. And what I love about, um, what I particularly admire about the direction of that play, looking back on it, was the way that Peter managed to capture this uh, warmth that technology can't give through the character of Winston and Julia, and in particular through that scene, that love scene in the in the hideaway place, right? I remember really clearly that he gave me no directions and no script. So whereas the rest of the play was scripted, that play, that piece in that room, we just had to make it up. And for me as a young actress, that was really scary. You know, just, we hadn't had a lot of um, practice and improvisation or things like that, quite the opposite. Um, and so, Looking back on it now, that awkwardness between me and Charles in that room, just making up shit as we went along, 
uh, taking off my clothes, saying something. It is actually very tender. It's actually very tender when you look at it in comparison to these automated scripted things in the text. And I think that's got a lot to say about today, that that tenderness is not present in our, in our technological world. That's what's missing, that warmth. It's a complex thing. I think that there's a myth that we, that we can um, uh, get, get kind of sucked into, which is that it's all, it's all bad. And I know that you're not saying that, Nancy, and far from it, but, but it does become a kind of a the um, privileged myth around technology sure, and, sure. and I think there are other aspects of it too and I and I think about that in terms of the kind of discussions that we used to have around sexuality where you know there was and this is very much the Michael Foucault kind of idea that you know we spent a lot of time talking about how we didn't talk about sex uh, whereas in fact we talked about <laughs> we talked about it a lot but always within the within the um, uh, inverted commas of we're not talking about it because we're so uh, we're so hung up or we're so kind of repressed. Whereas, in well, fact, when you explored it, the, the reverse was kind of true. You were talking about it, yeah. And, I mean, that's the character of Julia was interesting in that, in, that, in that situation, wasn't she? Like representing this kind of sexuality that um, was not repressed. And quite a pow- that was quite a powerful um, statement in that book, right, was that on the one hand... Her, her sex, she was actually having sex with lots of different people and she was initiating it. So it was quite a different situation than in porno sec. So that became quite a political, political act. And I, I agree with you that there's, I'm absolutely not saying that technology is negative mm. and that there are millions of fantastic things that it can do and is doing and is improving in our society. I'm really just looking at what's missing and I think what isn't there so we know what's there because we've just got so much now there is just so much we can do and we know what's there but i think we can forget what's not there and that's interesting to me when it comes to theater so what i'm saying is that moment when you on the stage as a performer feel the an audience become one you feel that concentration of an audience and when you're in the audience you have the same feeling that you're no longer just these separate people watching something but you are together watching something that's something really powerful that you can maybe get near to when we're all watching Jacinda on her update of COVID when the when the coronavirus is just um just come out and you can see the love hearts coming up on the screen. I mean, you can, you can, you can get closer to it in a moment like that. But I think live theatre has this opportunity to, to have this third dimension, which is the human warmth. Yeah, yeah. look, I really agree that that, that theatre offers that um, deep connection and that sense of presence. But I suspect that we will be seeing more of that happening in a um, yeah. hybridized interactive space as well. Yeah, and, and, that's ex- and so that, and like with books, like with um, bookshops, you know, I think that means that it becomes something precious, a niche. So uh, it will be a hybrid, but it becomes a niche. It becomes an experience like now, people thought that people were Marie Kondoing out their apartments and getting rid of all their books. Uh, and now a friend of mine has just opened a secondhand bookshop in Waihe. And it's going off because people are wanting to come back and touch books. But yeah. not the big bookshops like Whitcalls. That's not going to happen anymore. It's going to be something niche. And I think that's that hybrid that you're talking about. Will, it will, that will be the jewel in the crown for theatre. Because yeah. like I said, like that little piece with Julia and Winston, that awkward little intimate moment in the midst of that um, artifice, you know, the the theatre moment will become even can be could be would be exciting to be um, something that that feeds that's missing that's providing you know that's giving what the other stuff is not giving and the other stuff will continue to develop but I think that will become even more precious and yeah. would be an interesting thing to work with. Yeah, exactly, and there will be. Um an increasing tenderness because the, because of the, the other thing that you are talking about in terms of presence is the relationship between actors on the stage. So actors 
amongst themselves have a have a um, connectivity which is uh, shared but different from the connection that the audience watching has. And so, yeah. um, uh, as technology develops and we have kind of um, sensory suits and um, uh, you know chips inserted into our skin or, or are able to actually feel and touch and smell in a way that we in a in a online landscape in a way that we do currently in the in the real world um, that sense of deep connectivity between performers might actually come together in a in a digital world or in a virtual world as well so you know the, these are all things that you know like any particular time we're always in a transitional place between one place and another and um and i think that 1984 was really 1984 the future was now was a really um key and interesting and provocative uh glimpse at that hinge moment back then 35 years ago how bizarre is that 36 35 years, ago. years ago yeah yeah and so much of it uh, like big the hate the hate speech the hate week the 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 the, the resistance leader being put on tv and everyone getting riled up and screaming at him. I mean, I just think that's Trump, you know, like that, that's yeah. Trump, Trump supporters against the against Obama or against Biden or, or vice versa. I mean, that kind of manipulation that was so um, obvious in 1984, the future is now, is yeah. now completely woven into our into our into our fabric, and we're yeah, living and it. Incredibly prescient and and. And, and you know, really, this is the book. The book was very prescient about how yeah. lang how language constructs reality. So, the whole thing of double speak. And I think my character, maybe you, maybe you remember this, but I think my character was Symes, who was the the guy mm -hmm. who who was coming up with the um, the new speak uh, dictionary. The and um, yes, yes, very interested in the way that language rewriting. Yeah, that language sucked the reality out of. Um, out of the world, but um, but I guess I guess I am still very interested in the in the idea that we see a lot of um, we're very kind of um, pushed by dystopian futures and and images of dystopian futures, and I think that's what 1984, the future is now was as is the book, it was very dystopian. But I but I suspect that in reality. Um, it's a lot more complex than that. And even though, as you say, um, you know, that world feels very kind of similar to the, to the Trumpian tribalistic world that we've seen so much of in the last four years in the Western world, um, behind that, I think that there is a, that there is a complexity that um, it would be interesting to explore as well. And, and you know, this is kind of a tangent, but... But I was talking to um, a friend of mine who is uh, a diplomat in China, and he'd set up the new Australian consulate in Manchuria. Yeah. Um, and he was saying that, you know, because I was asking him, is this Zoom um, interview going to be recorded? And he was saying, look, every, is it going to be um, viewed by the Chinese government? Do you know what I mean? Um, would it be yeah. spied? And he said... The way that he operates is that everything that he does or every action that he takes online is collected by the Chinese government. So there is no kind of privacy in that respect. Their spyware is, is incredibly advanced as it is in the West as well. But he said the thing is nobody has the manpower to watch all that. You know, you can have algorithms coming up the Wahoo, but, you know, who gets to see it and who gets to scrutinize it and make the make the distinction as to whether or not you have um, crossed over the the prescribed line um, politically so so while you're always being spied upon at the same time you're still operating in an environment where you're not being looked at at all until yeah, yeah so yeah, so I mean that's a that's a kind of funny thing and it's a it's so the same when Sorry, no, you, you say. I was going to say, like you're saying, that complexity of it that makes that so complex, and I totally agree with you, hardly anybody's going to do anything with it, but they can if they want to, but it doesn't matter anyway because there's nothing we can do to get out of it. <laughs> so no, it's exactly. like 
there's no point worrying about it because the other day I, I tried to take Google Mail off my work phone because I understood that council was able to go into all of your things if you were using their Wi-Fi. So I thought, oh, I don't want that. I'll take Google Gmail off my work phone. But the only, I, you cannot log out of Gmail anymore from your phone. You can mm -hmm. on a computer, but you cannot log out. So the only way I could take Gmail off my phone was to take it off completely. So to have yeah. no use of it. So yeah. it's it's too late. You know, that idea of thinking you can, oh, you know, I'm going to pay in cash or I'm yeah. going to, you know, use a burner. It's it's completely, we're over that. Yeah. So it's I not, totally agree. It's not but what we've got is those little nucleuses that you're saying, Those that there are these little nucleuses of positive things. And I think what we need to be doing is, is working with those so that we can, um, rather than just worrying about artificial intelligence, whether it's good or bad, um, it's, it's probably going to come anyway, is working on how to keep the human. So let technology do what it's going to do because there's absolutely nothing we can do, but actually work really hard on keeping the human. Because I disagree with you that, you know, like we can get all of the, I've got a little guy next door, he's got the whole thing, the virtual reality, the gloves, the, um, and they will get better at it. But I'm watching my 99 year old mother dying. And I'm like, I don't care what you say, nothing is going to give me those eyes, nothing. So you can, you can make me feel her, you can put up images, but there is something, and I'm trying to do it with you now. I'm trying to see Stuart's eyes, right? But I can feel you. You're warm because I know you, and I can feel you. But the difference between if I was sitting here with you and looking into your eyes, and I'm just saying that is something that I think we've got to work on. So making the technology more human. And that's where I go back to the awkwardness. That's what I love about free theatre. Made people awkward didn't give them a slick show, had too long a pauses, things went haywire. That's what we need more in technology. We need to be able to somehow break up its slickness and tear open a place where we have to be more human. Yeah, no, I totally I agree. That could be an interesting place. Yeah, and I, and I totally agree. It's too late to opt out. So it is a matter of... Um, creating the thought models that find and, and encourage the positivity as opposed to always our default position being looking at technology in a dystopian in a dystopian way because the way that we think about it will determine the way that we choose to use it um, and the way that we kind of um, engage with it in a positive way. So I'm not trying to be flippant about it. I know that it is... Um, uh, at the moment, it can be distancing, but we have hints of the human connectivity yeah. of it. And I think if, um, if we kind of explored the medical usages of it or um, uh, other particular areas of it, we would find, because we're not experts in this, but we would find that there are many, many people who are seeing the potential of it in a very human way. Um, I completely understand, um, and, and my sympathies to you in regards to your beautiful mum, um, how just being with that person in the room is so, I mean, you can't replicate that experience. But at the same time, Nancy, if you were still in Italy and your mother was in this situation and um, COVID meant that you weren't able to travel, having that connect connectivity through, um, uh, through Zoom or, or however would still give you a very real connection with your mother, which would be very... Um, privileged and a rare thing to have. So, so, so there is um, humanity yeah. in all of this, and it's really, it's really up to us to project our humanity through the through the technology that exactly. we have, and and not to get kind of um, all wrapped up in and what's new is best. And in fact, oftentimes, you know, I've curated shows of advertising, and the the, the advertising that seems the most dated is the the ads that suddenly jumped onto the technology which now looks very old fashioned. So, um, so really it's just using this kind of technology in a way to find what is human about it and always resisting the cultural or corporate or political aspects where um, 
it's used negatively to subdue people. But um, so it's a two-way kind of struggle that's going that's going on in that place. Gave you double class good party uniforms, plus soft uniforms. Gave you new speak, duck speak. Make full the paddocks, valley full. One big mutton. Who make you? Do you know who make you? One big mutton. I good speak you. One big mutton. I good speak you. He is called Big Brother because he is double plus good. He is good speak and he is good act. He made the party.